bueno, yo no creo que no han servido para nada. Yo le diría a todos esos jóvenes, primero, que yo me identifico con, con su frustración, que me identifico con la desesperanza, pero que también los llamo a que no caigamos en, en la trampa, que es lo que busca la dictadura, de que perdamos la esperanza, que perdamos la fe y dejemos de luchar. Eso es lo que busca la dictadura. Y yo le diría a los jóvenes, que me preguntas de ellos, que asuman el liderazgo también, que asuman el liderazgo. El liderazgo en Venezuela, el liderazgo político necesita una renovación. Estoy convencido de eso. Y le hago un llamado a esos jóvenes que tú identificas para que eh, también sean parte de esa renovación del liderazgo. Hello, ladies and gentlemen and others. Welcome to From the North, episode number seven, I believe. Uh, I, think. I think, probably, you can check that later. Uh, it has been a week, two weeks, uh, since we released our last episode. We were kind of a little break. Happy, happy Thanksgiving Day here in Canada. Uh, and Columbus Day, because I guess... Columbus Day is tomorrow. Celebrates. Columbus Day is tomorrow. Columbus Day is tomorrow. We're not talking about that. We're not trying to get canceled. But today's Thanksgiving Day in Canada, so happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Um, Hermania, last week... You were doing something very interesting in the Oslo Freedom Conference thingy? Freedom Forum, Elu, get it right. Freedom Palooza. So Hermania was a Freedom Palooza in Miami, and uh, she got the opportunity to uh, talk to Leopoldo Lopez. No, 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 Leopoldo Lopez. And uh, I want to ask you, Hermania, how was that experience? What did you get out of that? And what are your thoughts? What are your, what are your thoughts at this critical moment for Venezuela? Yeah, so at the beginning of this episode, we showed you guys the clip uh, of the question I asked Leopoldo, of course, a very general answer about um, that he agrees with renewing leadership. But I don't know if that's true, Elu. I mean, I want to focus on Leopoldo's um, place in this conference, you know, because he was really... Um, celebrated as sort of uh, a Venezuelan hero along with other freedom fighters from all over the world. So that was pretty cool because that conference kind of does what we tried to do here from the North, which is unite all the people fighting for democracy in different countries, such as Syria, Iran. Uh, I met a bunch of people from Iraq, uh, a bunch of people from Ukraine, from Belarus, um, you know, all fighting against authoritarian systems. And Leopoldo was the one representing the Venezuelan cause. Um, it's interesting, Elu, because we, we've talked about this before. Uh, foreigners really loved the image of Leopoldo Lopez. He's kind of like a perfect figure to represent our cause. You know, he is a Harvard educated, handsome guy who says he's related to Simon Bolivar. So he just makes like a good um, character. And internationally, I think he's probably the most recognized Venezuelan uh, politician. Of course, us Venezuelans don't really feel that way about him anymore would you say Elu? i think we we were talking about it back when he was arrested when was that in 2000 so that was i remember clearly it was february 18th of 2014 he was arrested in chacao it was taken by the police that this happened like this is in 2014 like when the first like big protest against the Maduro regime started uh they started in february 12th of 2014 that was the beginning of the big the the escalation of the repression of the maduro regime that was like the first time that they really sent the tanks to the people six days later leopoldo got caught got sent to ramo verde and he stayed there for years so when when was he released or free from prison whatever like 2019 yeah i think it was in jail for about four years four or five years but it started because of that so like back in the day that was a big thing because you know he was like and he's always been really good at um projecting this image of a freedom fighter as a matter of fact the way edu was there when he turned himself into authorities and he did it in a brilliant way because he did it surrounded by you know people who supported him and you know there's this image i'll i'll put it in of him you know being taken into the police tank yeah. with as he holds a venezuelan flag and he i think he was next to a statue of jose martin yes. you know represented freedom so you know those images really captured the world's attention and he's always been really good at um handling the press abroad i will say yeah he's being he's definitely both in venezuela and out of venezuela he's 
always been one of the big important figures of the Venezuelan opposition. Uh, Initially, because he was so young, kind of like new blood back in the 2000s uh, when Primera Justicia first appeared in the scene in Venezuela. And then he got in he was a, he was a major, he got in prison, he got released. So it's the, the, the big thing about Leopoldo Lopez. But as you were saying, there's a big difference in how we and by we, I mean us who don't like the Venezuelan dictatorship, and I'm by we, I'm pretty sure 99% of Venezuelans, most of us saw Leopoldo as what we just described, a freedom fighter, right? But now we don't have the same perception as we used to have six years ago, whereas the world still has that same perception of the leader, of the brilliant, the, the new Simon Bolivar for Venezuela. But what changed, like, for us Venezuelans, because at the end of the day, that's what truly matters, right? If, if you are an opposition leader, you're supposed to represent your people. You're supposed to represent the Venezuelans. But what happened? What happened during those years ever since Leopoldo Lopez was this big figure and what he is today? Uh, and it's just a consequence of what we've seen today. It's the opposition and the government. Every day they seem to be blending together to a point where you cannot separate one from the other. And for people that have been paying attention to the to the Venezuelan situation politically, especially the Venezuelan opposition, it's not the same perception that we have from Leopoldo Lopez today as we had it six years ago. Six years ago, he was a freedom fire, fighter that was imprisoned unjustly by the regime. Today, he's doing lip service. He's doing lip service for some interest in the Venezuelan opposition, but at the same time, the Venezuelan opposition has some interests with the government. So it all feels kind of pointless to me what Leopoldo Lopez has to say. I don't know how you feel. Well, his strategy has changed. I would say when uh, before when we supported him, his speech was uh, against sitting down and negotiating with the regime. It was more, we know this is a dictatorship. You cannot negotiate with dictatorships. They don't leave this way. And he was more uh, supportive of the protest and civic disobedience, let's say. But now, and this is really what his message was at this conference, and it's just confusing because he says, the elections in November will not be free or fair, but we have to participate to not lose any spaces. Now, this is not what most Venezuelans agree with. And I know, by the way, there was a group of Venezuelans protesting Leopoldo Lopez outside of this conference. And other Venezuelans laughed at them. Oh, look at, you know, them hating everything. Um, and this was an organization uh, called Vepix that does so much for Venezuelan exiles and has been doing so yeah. for... 15 years before anyone cared about Venezuelans. But, you know, many Venezuelans wanted to laugh at them, whatever. In fact, these people were saying what a lot of Venezuelans believe, that is that Leopoldo Lop Lopez's speech doesn't represent them anymore, but yet the international community continues to believe that he represents all of us. Um, so, yeah, uh, that was the message. Um, these elections are fake, but we have to participate. So we know that by doing this, we've talked about this in the show a lot, we would be legitimizing the regime. Yep. But Leopoldo Lopez is just following the agenda of bigger fish like the European Union and Josep Borrell. So what happened uh, with the European Union this week and the Venezuelan elections? El? So the European Union has... Well, confirmed pretty much that they will be sending an uh, observation mission for the elections in November. Um, which kind of goes against what the entire international community, the consensus of the international community was just a couple months ago, which was that we cannot have free and fair elections if we don't have free and fair conditions in order to have these elections, which we still don't have. By the way, I want to be clear with this. There is nothing in Venezuela that can lead me to think that any elections are going to be free. Mainly because... And this is the problem, Edu, because not, nothing has happened, but these people are putting up a show as if changes have been made. Like, what are the changes they are pretending have been made? No, but let, let's talk about one of the changes that I love because it just really serves to prove our point, right? 
So the European Union has sent uh, uh, has announced that they are going to be sending uh, uh, a mission to observe the elections in Venezuela. The elections are coming in November, regional elections to which the opposition has agreed to participate on. Right. Um, but, you know, if you're normal Venezuelan, obviously you are not in, too much in favor with this because it's like, why are you guys sending an electoral mission when we are not recognizing these elections, when we understand that these elections are not going to be fair. Which, by the way, in the past, these international missions have been so harmful for the cause for freedom in Venezuela. Like uh, the Jimmy Carter Center yeah. once sent uh, one of these missions to Venezuela to just put his stamp of approval. So meanwhile, those of us who were trying to tell the world that there was a, an authoritarian regime uh, happening in our country, we would get the answer. But that Jimmy Carter Carter organization said these elections were real. But the European Union said these elections were real because they were there. Am I right or am I right? So that's like, that, that's uh, the big problem, right? But amongst this criticism, the European Union came out with, you know, with, with a statement saying, guys, like the fact that we're going there doesn't mean that we're necessarily recognizing Venezuela as a democracy. It just means that we want to be there to observe only 3% of the electoral tables, by the way. 3.5% uh, I'm so sorry 3.5% of the electoral tables but this doesn't mean that we're recognizing Maduro or the Maduro regime right they're saying that afterwards they yeah. will save the elections honey we can tell you now we that can they're tell not, you. because it's not only about this is what people don't get it's not about the date the day of the voting it's what happens before election day that it, matters. It's what happens before, it's what happens during, it's what happens after the elections. But yes, like they're saying that like, oh, well, after the elections, if we consider that the elections were not fair and plot twist and spoiler alert, they're not gonna. Um, then they can, you know, put something out and say, yeah, the elections were not fair and whatever. To this, to this, the response of this of the National Electoral Council of Venezuela, CN, uh, El CNE, uh, which according to the position is now a democratic institution because they have renewed their directors, according to the opposition, they have put some opposition people in the in the electoral council. These people were the first ones to put out a statement rejecting the statement of the European Union saying that they shouldn't get involved in Venezuela's business. So if you're telling me that this is the, the electoral council that the opposition supposedly is trusting, and this electoral council, it's defending the regime against Europe for what's going to be, and everyone knows it's going to be unfair elections, then what's the message that you, as an opposition, as Leopoldo Lopez, is telling me that you, you need to go to vote, you need to trust this system? Even though we know it's not going to be fair, even though we know they're going to steal the elections, because we cannot lose ground. What does that mean? What does lose ground? What does what what is that phantom the, that the opposition has that they always they're so focused on not losing spaces? What spaces? You don't have any spaces. You don't have any spaces. It's a, I mean, we had, after decades of working for it, we had crafted a space uh, in the international community where it was accepted that there is a dictatorship in Venezuela, but now we want to erase that with these elections. We want to erase that with these elections. And I, 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 you mentioned that here, and I think we need to go to that point because a lot of people, especially when you don't think hard about these things, when you don't have new ones, and especially when you haven't lived do, through these regimes, many people would think that just by the fact of having elections, that that tells you that a country is democratic. But as you said, there's so much more to democracy than just what happens on the day of the election. For example, right now, we can just talk about it right now. Most of the opposition, some of them who are the leading voices and tell people to go to vote, such as Enrique Capriles or Leopoldo Lopez, these people cannot run for public office in Venezuela. That's a fact. That's a fact. Like, Capriles, he hasn't been able to run for public office for almost a decade by this point. And he's telling people to go to vote. So you're telling me, oh, you cannot exercise your democratic right to be a candidate, but you're telling me to go to vote for those who can't. That's not democratic. That's not a democracy. When you turn on the news and you go to the first channel, and it's a state channel, and they're just spitting propaganda, 
when you go to the independent channels, such as Venevision, Globovision, Televen, which are supposed to be independent channels, what do you see? You don't see the news. You don't see people starving You're to not death. allowed to say the word dictatorship or the word regime or anything that would get you in trouble with the regime. These are facts. These are facts. Like, not we're not exaggerating. If you, you, if you guys go back to episode two, when we had Ana Milagros Barra in, in our show, one of the reasons she felt comfortable with us is because she could talk in English. But the same things that someone like Ana Milagros could say or people bigger than her, every person in Venezuela wants to say something against the regime on any public platform runs the risk of being persecuted by the regime. So that's yeah, they not have democracy. Learned, they have learned how to talk with euphemisms because there are certain words that are just, that will get you in jail and could get the, the media channel or radio uh, shut down, literally. But Elo, it goes farther than that. There, for some people, this is life or death because... These polit this establishment politicians like Leopoldo Lopez and Enrique Capriles are telling people to come out and vote for the opposition candidates when in the popular areas, in the poor regions of Venezuela, they are run by gangsters who are pro-regime and will literally uh, keep resources away from residents of their neighborhoods if they in any way stand against the regime, such as protesting or voting against the regime. We have death squads called the FAES, which will come into your house and kill you if they find out that you have been loud against the regime. So you're asking people to risk their lives by opposing the regime for a fake election too. So what does this feel to me? And I, and I could say hopefully to us, because you probably agree with this. If the opposition, it's clearly going to an election that's not democratic at all, but they're still pushing that so hard because they don't want to lose spaces. For me, it feels to me that they're not doing this for Venezuela. They're not doing this for me or you, Venezuelans and exiles. They're not doing this for 95% of, Venez of, of Venezuelans that are living in Venezuela under the poverty line. They're doing that for themselves. Because they're not getting anything. But who's getting stuff from this Mexico negotiations? We have seen several supposed opposition leaders who have been allowed to return to Venezuela, who have been handed a candidacy. Those are the only people who I see getting anything from this. People like Tomás Juanipa, who was leading, leading the negotiations. His role was a big role in the negotiations in Mexico. He just said, bye guys, went to Venezuela and started campaigning uh for the i think that he wants to be mayor of caracas so what does that tell me what does that tell you and what does that tell everyone in venezuela that wants to see a change that wants to see freedom if i have an opposition that clearly wants to participate clearly wants to be part of the system wants to be part of the regime because the only way to do that is to participate in these elections while not taking care of your people while not hearing your people and when people like us people like you a journalist people like me a shit poster or anyone there's to confront them there's to ask them the hard questions why are you not taking care of venezuelans why are you doing this for yourself instead of reflecting instead of saying okay we done fucked up they always have this condescending attitude towards Venezuela. And it's like, guys, you guys don't understand how complicated this is. Do you guys don't understand how the democracy process works? So just trust in us blindly. And if you don't, you are an ally of the regime. Let me tell you something. You are the allies of the regime. Mm -hmm. Fuck you. And we, we already know that every system and institution in Venezuela is corrupted, including the opposition. But what about the role that free countries, like those who make up the European Union, are playing in this? And organizations such as WOLA, who are, you know, supposedly fighting for freedom, but yet they are pushing this election that they would never accept in their own countries. Is the European Union going to accept to send... Uh, a, a block uh, to monitor elections while they only have access to 3.5% of polling places. Those are not the international standards accepted uh, for observation of elections. So is Joseph Borrell and the European Union going to be complicit in eroding the democratic norms that we have set up until this point? 
Are they also going to go to Nicaragua and accept lesser standards in an election that they do in their own countries? But they are not only accepting standards that they wouldn't accept in their own countries. Like Edu said, people such as the leaders of wall organization, uh, G of Ramsey, David Smaldi, they come after Venezuelans who say, hey, these elections are not real. I don't want to vote in these circumstances. And they will literally go on Twitter and harass you and say, well, what do you propose? There is a, a Venezuelan journalist who's beloved by all of us. Her name is Naki. Naki, we and love you. He was just saying a very, uh, something that all of us Venezuelans believe, you know, for those of, she says, for those of you who want to vote no matter what, you will question those who don't believe in the election. You speculate that to criticize the opposition is to go against them. And then you give lessons about the benefits of voting, but you don't say anything ag about the regime. You have nothing negative to say about the regime. Of course, the, the WOLA leader, David Smaldi, comes against Naki saying, so condescending. It's always so condescending. Like, with the air of this third worlders, just don't get it. Um, instead of discussing who's legitimate and who isn't, or, or, or who believes they're more than someone else, it would be interesting if you could tell us the benefits of not voting. Where Wola, I'll tell you the benefits of not voting, which is what happened last time when we refused to vote. We finally got the international community to accept that we had been living under a dictatorship for years. So you, that was the benefit. You guys, like, you guys don't remember that Maduro had elections in 2018 and we all decided, you know what, these elections are bullcrap. We're not going to participate on it. And that kind of gave us the momentum to form the interim government, rest in peace. <laughs> um, and, you know, finally, after almost 20 years of fighting against the Chavismo, Chavez first and then Maduro, we finally got the international recognition that we wanted. Venezuela is a dictatorship. Maduro is a dictator. There's no democracy in Venezuela. And we need to do something. But the Wola types... <laughs> They are so I call them the, the first world Latin American experts who for some reason these people have been in Venezuela for decades. They live inside Venezuela and they have been promoting this idea that we should deal with the regime as if it was just another democratic country and make excuses for them and accept lesser standards. Who funds these people? I want to know. It's like bro, bro, like open your eyes it's not so fucking hard to notice that venezuela is not a democratic country like you just gotta talk to people but and they of course are of the same people of the the classic venezuela is not real socialism and let me like let's put it let's put it on that perspective let's say that yes in fact we do not achieve anything by not voting well it's still fucking better than you know giving the government what they want which is recognition by going and you know voting in these fake elections so yes there's there's a, a, a better way to do this for starters we shouldn't be going to the elections, and then we should be treating this as the dictatorship that it is and the international community and this goes back to what we've been saying on the show the whole point of the show is that the free world cannot continue to sleep on authoritarianism and if you want to fight authoritarianism, this is not the way to do it. You're not going to tell us in Venezuela, oh, guys, you need to have elections. This is how you get out of the dictatorship. Oh, we're going to have elections with Maduro. Oh, thank you so much. I never thought about it. Are you going to tell that to Nicaraguans as well? Are you going to tell that to the Cuban people as they well? They are. Fuck they you. are. And it's always this same group. And they have to be called out, Edu, because they have so much uh, power internationally. You know, when you read stories about Venezuela and the New York Times and all, you know, the, the big newspapers of the world, the people cited are usually this first world Latin American experts from WOLA just selling this idea that the path forward is through elections. So we're going to be here reminding the world from our little corner that actually that is not the path forward. It has been tried before. It doesn't work. And I would just hope Elu, that eventually um, 
people who are not people from the first world who who may not understand what's going on in places like Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, maybe instead of getting a first world Latin American expert to comment on a story about Venezuela, why not have a Venezuelan political scientist like Ana Milagros? I'm gonna tell you, you why. Know? I'm gonna tell you why. Because there's this thing, this horrible thing called confirmation bias. So when you're a news outlet, such as the New York Times, who loves to give Wola a place to speak, and you believe in something, when you believe that, oh, you know what, Venezuela is not that bad, they, they definitely should have elections, you're not going to bring Hermania or Eduardo to talk about the situation, you're not going to bring Ana, you're not going to bring Luis Carlos, you're not going to bring Naki, you're going to bring the people from Wola, you're going to bring the people that are have never been to Venezuela, but they're experts on Venezuela because they've been to the the closest they've been to the Venezuela to, to Venezuelan territories when they invaded our our embassy in Washington because they would rather have code pink than an actual Venezuelan giving their opinion about well Venezuela. So yes, this is a problem and as you said Hermania, this is the whole point of, of this podcast is to call them out on their bullshit. And the tragedy in Venezuela, um, these people who have been defending the regime for decades, they have blood on their hands. They continue to do so. They are listened to internationally. They are listened to by foreign policy uh, operators in the governments of the free world. And they have... Uh, a responsibility on their shoulders of the fake story that they continue to sell the world about what's going on in Venezuela. Um, I wanted to mention, Edu, yesterday there was a trial of the elections. I don't know if this is something that's done in Banana Republic. The opposition candidate was attacked by uh, pro-regime uh, thugs. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is the elections that Joseph Borrell and the European Union want to put their stamp on. And um, we are going to hold them accountable for doing that and continue to remind the world that these are not real elections. Um, speaking of those elections that happen, uh, that are going to happen in November, um, there's going to be another protest in Cuba that's been planned. Um, and already the regime has been going into people's homes and arresting them for expressing a desire to participate in this protest. Like the example of this doctor, I'm going to put the tweet right here. Um, literally, this doctor participated in the July 11th protest and said online that he is ready to participate in the next one uh, and gets a, a, a Cuban agent knocking on his door. Uh, you said you're planning on protesting against the government. You're going to jail. And these are not the things that are being talked about when you see Cuba on the headlines. When you see Cuba on the headlines, the suffering of the Cuban people, when you see Cubans arriving by the hundreds to the shores of the United States, the, the, the talking point is obviously the embark. To mention this that I forgot in our brief before we started recording, Axios, this week, last week, Publish a story about Hispanic Heritage Month and Hispanic achievements and had a whole article praising the Cuban indoctrination education system. While this is going on in Cuba, that's what they want to talk about. Again. It's insane. It's like when people talk about the Cuban healthcare system or Cuban doctors, but it's like Cuban doctors, if this is a fact, they are, when they're sent, to other countries as you know humanitarian missions or whatever by the cuban government which is just essentially propaganda they have to sign the cuban government has to sign agreements with the recipient countries of these doctors so the doctors cannot flee and seek asylum while they're doing that so essentially the cuban government is exporting slaves doctors as slaves to other countries so they can work out on their propaganda machine and then come back to cuba to continue living a miserable life. When they try to say something in Cuba, when they're trying to do something in Cuba, because going out of Cuba, it's a matter of life or death, and sometimes it's not a possibility when they're trying to protest, like what's going to happen in November, and God bless everyone that's going to that protest, they can't. Because the military police goes into their places and takes them to their prisons Whoa. weeks before 
the elections because they're actively censoring any form of expression in social media, on the internet, graffiti, on the streets, art, poem, music. There is no way that the Cuban people have of criticizing the government without the government going after it. And that's not democracy, but oh my god, they have a literally system. Oh my god, they have a good healthcare system. Oh my god, we should be more like Cuba. Fuck you. I like I, I've said fuck you too many times on this show, but like honestly, no, so I call Axios and the writer out for this propaganda piece. Um, you know, because as you said, the regime is currently jailing people for planning on going to a protest. Not only that, but and I'm gonna put this case here too. Um, there is this case of a young gay Cuban called Joan de la Cruz who is going to prison for eight years for the act of holding up a mobile phone and recording the first protest in San Antonio de los Baños on the 11th of July during the historic protest. Well, he's going to be in jail for eight years for doing that. But no, Axios wants to talk about the, the, the education system that teaches children to read with uh stories about Che Guevara's heroism heroism and about how Fidel holds his missile. Let, let's talk about Che Guevara because this was a this was a week. This was a week to talk about Che Guevara because it's the anniversary of that uh horrendous human being's uh death and uh, I'm so happy he died. Um but then this was the golden opportunity for the big leftoids in the world to go out and go out of the way and say, oh my God, we're missing chess so much. We had Pablo Iglesias, former vice president of Spain uh, from the party Podemos, which let me remind you was funded by Venezuelan money. You like it or not, they were. By the way, Elo, do you know that when I studied abroad in Madrid, um, I had a Cuban professor and for my last... Um, paper or project it, i did it on um i don't remember what was the the basis of my paper but i included how venezuela had given money to podemos mm -hmm. well this professor took points away from me because she said that i was just repeating fake news no that's not fake news that's so a, throughout that's the a years i kept emailing her more proof more proof till this day she has refused to accept uh that she was wrong but this was the case in in spain when podemos was becoming popular that i know even as ones are annoying but we were telling young people yo these are communists the i promise you they're communists and here is paulo iglesias celebrating che guevara and i'm sure some people will st still say no they're not communists they want to be like norway <laughs> and like it, the funny the funny shit about Che and Fidel and the whole Cuban revolution kind of thing is that they are known and it's undeniable for what they did not only to the LGBTQ community, not only to uh, the academics, but overall what they've done to the Cuban people, right? And the, when you criticize them for what they did, uh, 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 an argument that comes often, often is like, oh, there were different times, you know, there were different times. Um, I'm pretty sure the regime doesn't doesn't feel that way about the LGBTQ community um, anymore. But these are the same people that tomorrow you're gonna see them on Twitter slamming on Christopher Columbus because that crackhead 500 years ago decided to sail from 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 Spain to India and happened to found some land in between. So let's take it even because okay uh christopher columbus a pretty terrible guy despite of his achievements but they take it farther they want to cancel george washington they want to cancel uh winston churchill but don't touch che guevara's image of a hero who never did any wrong when he literally said he was an actual white supremacist he was you know the 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 motorcycle diaries hollywood movie doesn't include parts of the book it was based on where he literally says european whites like to work and brown people don't it's a fundamental thing they used to say that being gay uh, what's a uh, what's they have a word for it a capitalistic degeneracy perversion. a perversion, perversion degeneracy yeah. Um, you know, and the people that are out there celebrating chess, the Che Guevara's life and achievement or whatever, are the same people that go out of their way to, rightly so, defend the LGBTQ community. So, like, 
where where why are you so hypocritical why do you only care about nuance when it fits your agenda could it be that it's not about you know values and more but ideology oh my god do you think it's about ideology how we cracked it how we cracked it open and communist ideology because these are the same people who like to say um you know that socialism is in communism that socialism is in fact social democracy all this misinformation um they tattoo che guevara on their skin they wear the shirt i mean the first world loves this guy elu no matter where i've been to you find a graffiti of che guevara you find someone wearing a shirt a you shirt find... that's that's so, the worst imagine you know there are people who have their family members shot to death by Che Guevara and have to see his image praised around the world. I'm going to do it. I'm going to compare it. You celebrating the image of Che Guevara to some people is the same as you wearing Hitler's face on your shirt. It is. So stop doing it. Get informed. Talk to Cubans. Talk to Venezuelans. Talk to Nicaraguans. Listen to us. Do not listen to Wola. Do not listen to Gray Zone. Do not listen to Axios. These are propaganda outlets. If you really want to be informed, you want to talk to the people that are coming from these countries. And this extends further than Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba, which for obvious reasons are the closest, um, call it, struggles for us Venezuelans. But this goes well, to... But particularly with the situation with Che, because his legacy still in these countries where millions are being oppressed, you know, this is not... That's over with what he did. The system that he established is today still murdering people. I remember, I remember when I, I was still living in Venezuela, lining up to buy fucking diapers for my for my uh my my, my sister's little uh son who was about to be born at that time, lining up on a Wednesday, no, on a Friday because my national identity document ended on a nine. So if you live in a communist or a socialist country, you got to go on a Friday to buy diapers because you cannot go on any other day and you have to buy them from the government, etc., etc., etc. I remember lining up for this while at the same time seeing graffitis of, of, of Che Guevara and Chavez, of Fidel and Chavez, seeing the revolution is immortal, the revolution is successful, the revolution has saved the people while the people are starving, while the people are lining up for diapers, for a piece of bread, for fucking toilet paper. So it, it, when, you, when I see Che Guevara, when, when it doesn't mean the same thing that it could mean to a student of you know NYU that's taking sociology and he wants to be very cool and wants to be very leftoid and who wants to support Che Guevara. For me, it takes me back to that line that I was making to buy some diapers. So please stop it. Stop it. Get some help. Also, El, the United Nations celebrated him on the anniversary of his death. You know, Che Guevara went on the stage and literally said he will not apologize for shooting uh any cuban who disagreed with this revolution dead it's and, and the united nations is celebrating this while denouncing the u.s embargo on cuba so what does that say about the united nations so what does for example the united nations and i invite you all if you don't follow the twitter account of un watch please go and do so because it really it really puts everything into perspective when you see that countries like Venezuela, countries like fucking North Korea have a quarter or a tenth of the sanctions that countries like Israel would have. And again, I'm not here out to defend Israel, but come on. We're here to call out the hypocrisy. Come on. So, and again, it's just, it goes back to what we were saying about Leopoldo Lopez. Like, why the first world loves to see Latin American freedom fighters as this, like, you know, they have to be handsome. They have to have cool clothes on them. Stop focusing on these figures and focus on the freedom fighters today, like the gay young guy in Cuba who's in jail for eight years for protesting. Make him a hero. You know, make the Venezuelan students who were fighting and protesting to to elevate the image of Leopoldo Lopez. Make them heroes. And here's the thing. You know? For us, these people are heroes because they are people like Basil da Costa, people like Genesis Carmona. All, all hundred thousands of Venezuelans have been murdered 
by the regime, assassinated by the regime. We know them, we remember them, but when we try to do so, and I don't know if you know, uh, uh, and to put everyone in context, Basil da Costa was the first student to be shot dead during the protests of uh, 2014 in Venezuela, in a corner in downtown Caracas, in, in a place called La Candelaria. In the place he was shot and killed, people remember that place and, and turn it into a mural. There was a mural with a picture of, of Basil. People will have flowers in the place just to remember him, remember his sacrifice, remember that how he was unjustly killed by the regime. And what did the regime do? They painted that a couple months ago. They painted over it and it's forgotten and it's gone. But they probably want to put paint it over with another graffiti. Check it out. But for every graffiti of Basil that disappears, 10 graffiti is made by the government of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro are popping up. So, yeah, so like, don't do it. Don't support Che Guevara. Don't buy a shirt. Don't be stupid. Don't be don't Not be only don't support him, but when you see someone celebrating these people, tell them why they shouldn't. You know, a lot of people have bought into the idea sold by the Hollywood movie. And they, they really don't know that Che Guevara has this homophobic, racist, white supremacist history. So let them know. Give them the quotes. I'm going to put, I, I wrote something uh, kind of to debunk the misinformation around Che Guevara. I'm going to put the link under uh, the YouTube video. I, I have some of his quotes there that are in his book. So just copy paste, send them the quotes and, and ask them if they agree with that um, point of view and, and speak up when you see this type of things. It's time to stop celebrating these figures that to so many mean the destruction of their countries and the deaths of their families. It, it's time to stop. It's time to stop. Stop celebrating Chavez. Stop celebrating Maduro. Stop celebrating Che Guevara. Stop celebrating Fidel. Like, if you really want to die on a hill fighting for something stupid, don't don't make it don't make it so you're defending Che Guevara. Don't make it so you're defending Fidel Castro. Don't make it so sure you're defending General Mao. Because that's what they do. And, 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 and taking it in further, I understand, especially, I know most people listening to this are people that are well informed. And thank you guys for supporting the show. Thank you guys for always coming back and listening to us. But really, what we're trying to do here is we're really trying to get across to people that are not necessarily, have not necessarily listened to what we have to say, to the arguments that we have to bring you guys. And that's kind of the main reason we do this whole thing in English is so it can, you can share it to people that maybe don't know or people that are not as informed. Um, and I'm going to tell you something. If you're one of those persons that are listening, I get it. If you're an American, if born and raised in America and you, and you read about the history of America, yes, there are many things that the United States did horri horribly, horribly to other nations and other countries in the world, imperialism, we're not going to deny that. But what you have to understand is that not everything that's anti-America, it's inherently good. And that goes especially when it comes to Cuba, that goes especially when it comes to China. Especially when it comes to Venezuela and every country that calls itself anti-imperialism. While at the same time, they're supporting different kinds of imperialism. Because if your problem is with the United States imperialism, if your problem with the United States imperialism, it's the, it's, it's the US and not the imperialist part. And you're going to be out there supporting China doing the same thing. You're going to well, be che out was, there. Che was killed while in Bolivia on an imperialist mission to spread communism to Bolivia. Che was killed in Bolivia when he was trying <laughs> to, to But then people people celebrate the the invade like Che who was trying to invade Bolivia and they don't celebrate the Bolivians who stopped him and kept their, you know, integrity and their autonomy away from Fidel. Exactly. And when you when when we we Latin Americans, every person in the world, we love autonomy. We want to be autonomous. We want to be democratic. But when you come to us with solutions that we know are not going to work, that we know that are going to only prolong the problem further, that if anything, this is taking us back like 10 years in our struggle against Chavismo. If we go back to having this fake elections in place being recognized by the international community community sorry this is taking us 10 years back in in, in our struggle 
guys, this is this is not what you think it is. This is not the autonomy you think you're fighting for. You're just you fighting know, to super... prolong a system of authoritarianism, in death and misery. I'm super against the death penalty, but I'm thinking if there is one way that I think it's fair to be killed is while trying to invade a country <laughs> to yeah. implement brutal communism. So we celebrate the death of Che Guevara, as always, as usual, the only good communist. It's a dead one. You can blip that because I don't want to be censored again. <laughs> we were censored guys we were censored both of us were censored yesterday can you believe that it just goes to show why we get along uh, because edu made a joke about i don't even know if i should say it. we both made jokes about killing and we <laughs> both we got our account my instagram a post got taken down his twitter account got taken down for a while but this was independently on the same day so what does that say about us edu, that we both <laughs> But I want to put things into context. So, what 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 did your post that was censored? What was it? Because it's just so funny. It was so silly. I had posted a picture with a dog, and I I said, "Don't tell Trulis my cat, or I kill you." <laughs> and, and they took it down. I tweeted that intellectual property is a myth. That's a different conversation. We, we're not gonna have it today. Uh, and it's stupid that you're out there defending a company, so just kill yourself if you're doing that. And they censor me for 12 hours? It was a joke! But I guess I can't <laughs> joke now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this was our show for today, and you already know, I know these are things that are not popular to say, but if you're at a party and you see a motherfucker with a Che Guevara shirt, walk up to him and tell him the truth. I've done it, I went to NYU and you don't know how many parties I ruined. I don't care. Um, I'm not trying to see that homophobic white supremacist face when I'm trying to have fun and you should not either. <laughs> praxis. That's what we call praxis. Thank you guys. See you next week. So much for coming and see you next week. <gasps> oh, bye. <laughs>